Hi everyone, my name is Nicole. I'm the First Nations Health Officer 2024 Outlook. Um, and I've been asked to do an acknowledgement of country for this year's AGM. Before I jump into that, I would just like to mention that I myself do not identify as First Nations. However, my role is not representative. It is uh, to provide a platform for First Nations voices to educate us as future healthcare professionals. So in order to acknowledge our First Nations people and rural Australia in a COVID safe manner, uh, this year Outlook curated a First Nations stargazing guide to celebrate 65,000 years of stories in the sky from one of the oldest living cultures on the planet. Um, and also to pay an homage to uh, the rural Australian night sky. Um, and whilst I read an excerpt, I encourage you all to pay respects to elders past, present and emerging, and also acknowledge uh, all the respective country on which we gather here tonight. So, during the dream time, there lived a ferocious, enormous emu named Chingle, and deep in the Mallee scrub, he jealously guarded a giant emu egg. One day, Cheeky Wa, the crow, was flying above, spied the emu egg and grew hungry, and so he decided to feast. Chingle was furious and decided to chase Wa to enact revenge. But during the chase, Chingle grew hungry and he spied a man out hunting named Bunya. But Bunya was not very brave. He was a very timid man and upon realizing that Chingle was chasing him, he quickly scrambled up a tree as quickly as he could to hide. Meanwhile, while the crow had flown north and come across the Bram Bram Bulk brothers, who are two dingo brothers placed on this earth by Bunjil, the eagle, who is the great ancestral spirit who created our world. And they were placed on the earth by Bunjil uh, to look after the natural order. So in order to restore natural order, the Bram Bram brothers decided to kill Chingle. And they then ventured south, coming across the tree that Bunya was hidden in. But Bunya didn't believe that Chingle was dead and refused to come down from the tree when the brothers disclosed this information to him. And furious at this cowardice, the eldest brother decided to wave his spear and condemn Bunya to hunting only in the treetops and eating food only at night. So this story is written in the stars and I'll just share my screen with you to show this. So we start here with Bunya, the ringtail possum, and he rests amongst the Southern Cross with his nose forming the head of the Southern Cross. The easternmost star is Druk, who is the mother of the Bram Bram Bulk brothers, who form the pointer stars here. Up here, we have Wa the Crow, who sits safely on the other side of the night sky. And he is known in European astronomy as Canopus, the second brightest star in the night sky. And here we can see um, Chingle, the giant emu, um, spread across the night sky from the Southern Cross to the horizon. And he sits just above the European constellation known as Scorpius. And finally, this is the great ancestral spirit, Bunjil the Eagle. And he is known in European astronomy as the brightest star in the sky, Sirius the dog. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I would just like to point out that the Southern Cross has many different interpretations across Australia. And these are stories from the Kulin Nation um, and from clans that form the Kulin Nation who reside in Victoria. And thank you very much. So, we're going to get underway with our talk now. Um, so, um, although Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander adults, as we know, make up about 2% of the Australian population, they constitute 27% of the national prison population. 
Um, there have been five Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander deaths in custody recorded since June. Um, and with mass attention finally being drawn to this area, it has been disappointing to say the least to see what has happened since the Black Lives Matter movement, especially with regards to the Raise the Age campaign. Um, today, I'm hoping we can learn a bit more about this population and the unique challenges they face from our two guest speakers. Um, and at the end, there'll be a chance to answer quest sorry, to ask questions. Um, so I'll be putting a link in the chat shortly that you can um, click and you can submit questions there and you can upvote ones that you really want to know the answer to. So I'll do a brief introduction of my um, two guest speakers before they introduce themselves. So um, Professor Stuart Kinner is an NHMRC Senior Research Fellow, Head of the Justice Health Unit at the University of Melbourne and Head of the Justice Health Group at the Murdoch Children's um, Research Institute. He is very experienced with um, over 250 publications and he's attracted more than $26 million in research and consulting funds. Stuart chairs Australia's National Youth Justice Health Advisory Group and the WHO Health in Prisons Program Technical Expert Group. He is a member of the WHO Steering Group on Prisons Health. And our other speaker is Associate Professor Megan Williams. Um, she is the research lead and assistant director of the National Center of Cultural Competen Competence at the University of Sydney. Megan is a Wiradjuri, is Wiradjuri through her father's family and has over 20 years experience working on programs and research to improve the health and well-being of Indigenous people in the criminal justice system. Um, she is a chair of the Justice Health and Forensic Mental Health Network Human Research Ethics Committee and a trained Aboriginal Family Wellbeing Program facilitator. Megan has conveyed Indigenous people's research stories and expertise to professional bodies, communities, parliamentarians, students and the media. Megan is a director and contributing editor of health media organization Crokey.org and associate editor of Health Sociology Review. Um, she is affiliated with UNSW's School of Public Health and Community Medicine, UNE Center for Rural Criminology and the Sydney Institute of Criminology. Um, so with that being said, um, I might ask Stuart first to tell us a bit about your job and the research you've done in this field. Sure, thanks. Uh, and thanks, Jade and Alistair and everyone for the invitation to join you guys tonight. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I want to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that I'm on, um, which is the land of the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation and pay respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Um, uh, I'll be quite brief because we don't have a ton of time. Um, I'm not a doctor. Uh, my PhD is in psychology and I actually enrolled initially in a PhD in clinical psychology um, I was very interested in mental health problems uh, and then changed to a research only PhD because I thought we'll do great research, change policy and make the world a better place. Um, so, uh, you know, the naivety of young PhD students, what can you say? Um, but for the last um, 16 years now, since I finished my PhD, I've really been sitting in public health and my work pretty much constantly over that time has been focused on the health and well-being of people who experience incarceration or have other sorts of contact with the criminal justice system um, and so the point here is that i'm i'm not interested in the criminal justice system per se um, it just turns out that that's one place where you find people with underserved health needs um, it's a place where there's a concentration of marginalization and disadvantage um, and it's a, a system that unfortunately in some ways compounds that disadvantage. In other ways it doesn't, but I'll come back to that later. Um, so really, really briefly, I'm a full-time researcher. That's what I do. I'm very interested in trying to create meaningful change um, with the research that we do. I'm mostly a quantitative researcher, so I think it's a good kind of um, uh, two-part presentation here because uh, Megan, who I've known for many, many years, is a very, very experienced mixed methods, but I think mostly qualitative research, but Megan will speak to that. Um, so I think we can probably come with two different complementary perspectives here. Thank you very much. And um, Megan, could you please introduce yourself a bit more as well? Yeah, Yira uh, Dumarang, that's g'day in Wiradjuri language and um, my father's family. Um, our country is Mudgee, so Give me a wave if you've been there. There's a few nods. Um, and our family are the Mooch people from Northeast Wiradjuri country. Um, I live in 
um, in Warung in Sydney and uh, so I pay my respects to the Gadigal, one of the 29 clan groups of the Eora Nation. And uh, as Wiradjuri, we're astounded um, at Gadigal and Eora um, capacity to live um, in close quarters with each other on a small patch of land. Wiradjuri is the largest um, sized um, nation of, of all our Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander nations and um, the northeast was particularly badly hit um, after smallpox and massacres occurred in um, in um, Eora Nation and then to a certain degree the two or three nations between but um, but once you go down the hill from the Blue Mountains, country opens out wide and that's the beginning of Wiradjuri country. And it was, um, the lands were granted, um, oversubscribed, more land was granted um, than what the governors realised. And so very quickly the, in the 1830s, there were um, massacres. Um, and my family history goes back to right then, our uh, William's name. Um, just comes from it being applied. That's the same William's name from the 1890s um, that was applied to our family that I've still got today. And um, yeah, so I suppose for me, I, you know, very, um, I'm Western social science trained, um, you know, in the early 90s. And I went into research because already within five years of working in health promotion, you could see the the same cycles go around and as government um, staff changed and corporate knowledge was lost, you'd have to sort of begin again as a service provider, I suppose, and build the relationships and try and get the funding um, to do what we needed it to do. So I pretty quickly realised that program evaluation was an important tool, a really important advocacy tool. And also there was training, um, ongoing training in research. So um, I do tend to do constantly be doing some type of program evaluation and I think it comes from um, a real belief, um, it, hopefully an informed belief that Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander ways of um, doing research are actually really valuable for social science or Western social science research and what I call that or the worldview or the matrix that we look through is holistic and I don't understand which humans don't need holism in their health and Aboriginal definition of health is that you take into account social emotional mental physical spiritual health of the individual as well as of the family and the community so I don't get why that's Aboriginal definition of health I reckon it probably should be human definition of health and the World Health Organization's definition goes pretty close to that and partly because there were Aboriginal people at the table when that definition was um, being negotiated. So that's a, just a little hint at how Indigenous knowledges are through a lot of things, If you, but we often don't know what we're looking at um, or listening to. Also, I love um, working intergenerationally because in my own family, I mean, one of my earliest memories, which I didn't really recall until I stepped over the um, threshold when the doors of Long Bay Jail were moved because I was used to um, over the last say seven or so years going into a particular um, entry door to the Long Bay Jail but then it was moved back over the old stone step and I had a full body experience of I remember being here when I was three years old and um, so incarceration issues have always been in my family and um, and among um, friends and also when I got serious about research was um, it was 19 years ago when my cousin who's my next cousin in line um, with me hung himself by his shoelaces in um, a correctional center that I'd done health promotion workshops in so I knew you know the entry scanning and I knew you know what the corridors and the smell was like. And I was absolutely shocked that, um, you know, I was in grade 12 when the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody recommendations were handed down. And that was pretty full on as a modern history student. We um, really grappled with that. But then I never thought that it would come so close in my own family 
Um, I'm, I am the only one in my batch of cousins to have gone to uni, graduated. Most people in my family don't know. I've done a PhD and um, wouldn't have a clue that I'm an associate professor because knowledge is one thing, but you know, life experience and your participation in the community is um, the other really important part of the picture. So that's why I do, yeah, constantly volunteer. I'm a volunteer in a correctional centre. Um, and also um, constantly writing up people's life stories as well. And um, yeah, I just think there's just so much to learn from Aboriginal community controlled health organisations. So if you don't know Nacho, that's my biggest hint is that you find out who they are and what their models are about and, um, and follow along with that. So yeah, at the moment, um, really mm. I work at at the workforce level, I don't research Aboriginal people and their needs and issues necessarily in the justice system. I'm really more focused on um, the gap, you know, close, we talk about closing the gap. And I think that the gap is the mainstream workforce's confidence in working with us um, and really putting Aboriginal ways first and foremost in this country, which is our right in this country as um, sovereign owners. And, um, but I don't um, come angry because I can't afford anger in my life. Not, not, you know, I've got a 24 hour rule that I'll sit with it. Actually, I have to be a really peaceful person to be well, and um, I'm all about unity. So I just bring that to, you know, to you today. The issues very much are about racism and exclusion, bias and um, the sadness. I'm so sad for all of you that you don't know, you know, you don't get to know the world um, with the richness of Indigenous cultures and ways of knowing, being and doing that we do. So that's, you've got my wholehearted encouragement of being here, I suppose. So yeah, I'll leave it at that for now. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much, Megan. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for sharing your story. Um, and hopefully, yeah, we'll be touching on um, what you've just mentioned as we go through tonight. Um, I think what I'd like to first ask you both is just kind of what are the major health issues faced by First Nations people in custody and how do these compare to non-Indigenous people? Either of you can go. <laughs> you want, Megan, do you want me to go first? I can do the numbers and then you can give them meaning maybe and, and give your perspective. And, oh. <laughs> um, look, uh, I would say the, the health issues facing um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in custody are the same health issues facing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the community. And again, just to remind people that, you know, there's this often this kind of um, implicit notion that people in custody are somehow different and not part of our community. And obviously they come from and return to our communities. And so um, they're the same health issues. What's different in custody, um, again, recognising this concentration of morbidity in, in custodial settings is that, that the prevalence of everything is higher. Um, whichever, whatever health issue is your um, favourite one that you like to be interested in or concerned about, the prevalence of that is higher in custody than it is in the community. Um, that's true for both Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people. Uh, what's different, of course, is that Indigenous people are so dramatically and increasingly overrepresented in the criminal justice system. I mean, at the time of the Royal Commission that Megan referred to, um, Indigenous people were eight times more likely to be in prison. We're now over 13 times, um, despite a recommendation from the Royal Commission in 1991 to reduce that um, discrepancy. So the, the health issues are myriad. And the other thing that I think is key is that multi-morbidity is normative. In other words, um, uh, you know, we, we, we have uh, people in prison with mental health problems, um, with uh, communicable diseases. Hepatitis B is a really important one, obviously, for, people, for Indigenous people in custody. Um, Non-communicable diseases, diabetes, um, cancer, uh, uh, asthma, um, uh, self-harm, um, health risk behaviours, um, substance dependence. All of those concerns are highly prevalent um, in custody. Uh, and for most people, multiple health problems co-occur. And the critical importance of that is that they often they co-occur in what's known as a syndemic way. I don't know if people know what the, I've come across that term, syndemic. 
Um, it's, it's a contraction of two words and it refers to the idea of synergistic epidemics. Um, so for example, mental health issues and communicable disease and substance dependence are, are syndemic conditions. They interact in a synergistic fashion to compound one another. Um, and the other important thing about this multimorbidity is that because of the incredibly high prevalence of complex multimorbid conditions, multi-sectoral coordinated care for people in custody is absolutely critical. Um, and again, that's true for Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people. And um, in a way, I'm kind of a bit of an imposter here in this because um, what I'm going to, to argue is that in many important ways, um, things are not completely different for Indigenous and non-Indigenous people in custody. The problem is that we have structural racism and a range of other factors that are driving Indigenous people into that system at an extraordinarily high rate. Um, so those are some of the problems. Uh, a couple of quick things I'll, I'll illustrate to make a point and then pass over to Megan. The first is that uh, if you look at the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare's Prisoner Health Report, if you haven't seen that, I'd encourage you to have a look. Every three years that collects data on the health of people in prison in Australia. Um, and at the back, I think it's page 164 in the most recent report, is just a list of the indicators all stratified by Indigenous status. One of the things that's striking there is that um, it looks like the prevalence of mental health problems is lower in Indigenous people than in non-Indigenous people coming into custody. The reason for that is that it's based on a survey where they say, have you ever been diagnosed with a mental health problem? Um, now, we know that there's selective under um, recognition of mental health concerns for Indigenous people coming into prison. Um, Megan and I both work with Ed Heffernan in Queensland, who's done some fantastic work. Um, he published a report called Family Business, looking, for example, at the, at the mental health of incarcerated Indigenous women um, and documenting extraordinarily high rates of PTSD, so post-traumatic stress disorder. So um, not only do we have high rates of mental health problems for Indigenous people coming into custody, we have under-diagnosis of those problems. So what that means is that unfortunately, um, the criminal justice system becomes this awful and regrettable public health opportunity to start identifying the, the needs, the health needs of people in custody. That is absolutely not what we want. What we want to be doing is, is providing appropriate care to identify and respond to those health needs in the community, not least because they're health needs that drive people into custody. The other thing that I'll say um, just quickly <clears throat> is that um, when we talk about the health needs of people in custody, we're really talking about the health needs of people who experience incarceration and nearly all of them return to the community. Um, and what we do know as well is that for the vast majority of people, their health is unfortunately better in prison than it is in the community. So if you look at the most recent prison health report, um, somewhere in the order of 90% of indigenous people in that 2018 study said, said that their health was the same or better in, um, since they'd come into prison. So there are definitely things we can do better about prisoner health, um, but unfortunately, um, we're doing even worse in the community. We're just not meeting the needs of people. So if we're interested in improving the health of people, Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people who experience incarceration, um, I've talked about coordination of care. The other key thing is continuity of care. Um, because unfortunately, what we tend to do is band-aid people's health problems in custody um, and then give them no support when they return to the community. And unfortunately, things typically quickly become um, very, very bad again. Um, there are exceptions, of course. And on that happy note, I'll pass over to Megan to hopefully have some more positive things to say. Yeah, thanks, Stuart. But I um, mean, you know, I could listen to you, you know, for ages because, um, yeah, you always have such a clear mind about the he about health issues and, yeah, big respect to that. Um, and I think I'll, I'll just add maybe about frameworks too and thinking about health in a broad sense. Um, you know, I don't know if, and hopefully in your um, med ed, you've learned about socio-ecological models and or multi-level empowerment where, um, you know, health has the individual layer as well as family and then there's community service dimensions and then there's system dimensions. And in Aboriginal ways, we just know to work at all of those levels 
all the time. Even when I was in health promotion, we still did um, like in-service training to other organisations. I might have run, you know, health promotion workshops on Hep C, but we still would train other workers and we still did submissions and tried to contribute to the evidence base. So that was that example of working across all those levels. So it's pretty simple and, you know, most of you will do some of that in your um, careers as well. So always thinking that there's issues, there's going to be problems and solutions at each of those levels and individuals, you know, it, like, you know, Stuart's um, indicated. But then thinking about um, also, do you know that um, the river of health where there's upstream, midstream and downstream determinants? Yeah, so, um, so when we think about, um, you know, it's really important to always push yourselves to tease out what's poverty compared to what's Aboriginal culture. And unfortunately, those two have been put together um, there's extremely low expectations about us as Aboriginal people. Um, you know, this country was founded on the belief that we were less than human and the white Australia policy, you know, that's right up until the 1970s. So many of our uni lecturers, you know, they and our parents, they've been raised with that belief that really as Aboriginal people, we're subhuman and not able to take care of ourselves. And we're certainly not worth look, listening to or believing in or any of our ways are not worth um, using as well. So that's still really present today. Hence, you know, every, most people not having um, Indigenous knowledge is centred in medical education curriculum, for example. It's slowly catching up, but nowhere does it privilege Indigenous knowledges um, to take care of Indigenous peoples. We're still looking from a Western lens to fix problems Aboriginal people have. Um, so it's also important to kind of flip that to be thinking that actually the system can create a problem in that because it's biased. And, but then there's this other issue thinking that, well, most Aboriginal people actually do live in urban areas, you know, there's, so maybe we're just pretty assimilated and we don't really want, um, well, like the romantic notions of who Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are as well. But, um, you'll see, in, you know, artwork and all that, the boomerangs and spears and, you know, those things are illegal. You cannot, we cannot use those in urban Australia. We'll end up in jail, you know, if I get on the bus tomorrow, you watch with a spear or something. So, um, you know, so we've also got to be really checking our assumptions um, that they're not those old leftovers from the past. Actually, there's much more to Aboriginal ways of doing business that are about processes. Um, you know, the way we do group work, the way we have consensus-based decision-making, the way it's a very hierarchical um, age, ageist society where I'm middle aged. My role is to be a worker, to listen to what the elders say needs to be done, to do that work because biologically I'm able, I'm really capable for not much longer, but anyway. Um, and I've got teenagers and I can see how they're getting ready to absorb all of my information. They're tuning in now to exactly what I'm doing and what I'm working for and they're starting to take on those um, messages. So you can see how we, we just um, intergenerationally. So our systems don't support us in doing that. You know, um, I'm just trying to say that Aboriginal culture is more than dot art and more than, um, you know, even that beautiful story, but you've got to really think about what, what does that mean? What do we get from that? Just be really careful that it doesn't confuse us more as well about who Aboriginal people are and how we then be together in this country. Um, the other thing is that, uh, you know, who's seen the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander map? Because if you don't have a copy of that, do yourself a favour and get one. If you're going to be in clinical practice, put it up. In your, um, and we'll get to what you got to do, um, you know, well, soonish. But um, but it's the um, 
we can create more problems if we take a state or federal approach rather than a local approach because our Wiradjuri um, northeast is very different to the west and we have very different resources. So in terms of health planning as the other part of health, um, it's taking a local approach and if we cannot do that, we must ask why because actually otherwise we're contributing um, to the poor response to issues. So you'll see how, um, hopefully naturally, you see how we can take in individual as well as system issues when we're talking. Um, and so to get used to that and really, really push yourself in being able to do that in order to be part of the solution and um, not part of the problem, I suppose. Thank you very much. Um, so my next question for you, and this might be a bit similar um, in terms of what Stuart was saying about similar issues um, between non-Indigenous and Indigenous Australians, um, but I'm curious to know what the impacts are of imprisoning First Nations children. And I might, we might continue with this order, so we'll get Stuart to go first. Sure, I'll give two brief answers. <clears throat> the first is the researcher answer. Um, so last year we had the opportunity to write the health chapter in a thing called the UN Global Study on Children Deprived of Liberty and our job was to review all of the evidence globally in any language on the impact of incarceration on the health and well-being of children. Um, and, and it turns out there's actually remarkably little evidence um, of long-term health harm. Now that's not because it doesn't do harm, it's because there's very little research um, of a sufficient quality to really explore this. The other reason is that in some wealthy countries, um, in some ways, just like in the adult system, uh, youth detention can help in some limited ways like catch up vaccinations and things of that sort. Um, but certainly the, the, the weight of the anecdotal evidence and the clinical impression and the views of people when you speak to them who work in the sector is that it's harmful. So my second very brief answer um, uh, is uh, related to a few years ago, I gave evidence at the NT Royal Commission that followed from the Dondale episode. And this is all part of the record, so I can share it with you. Um, it was put to me, uh, this is an illustration. There was a young um, girl who was, um, had a history of self-harm, who was in detention in Dondale, and her mother had passed away. Um, and she asked for permission to go to the funeral, and that was refused. And she said, I'm going to self-harm. And so the prison, that youth prison at the time, had one protocol for people at risk of harming others and at risk of harming themselves, which was to put her in solitary confinement. Um, and she said, don't leave me by myself, leave me with my friends, leave me with people to support me. They didn't. She self-harmed. Um, long story short, this continued with multiple self-harm episodes over multiple days before someone finally saw the light and allowed her some peer support in the prison. Now, I think it's safe to say that that's harmful. Um, so uh, I think, again, in many ways, um, the harms are there for Indigenous and non-Indigenous kids. And again, Indigenous kids in Australia are 24 times more likely to be in detention than the non-Indigenous kids. In the Northern Territory, 100% of kids in detention are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander kids. Um, so the, the, the overriding problem is the massive overrepresentation of young Indigenous kids in that system in the first place. Um, but Megan may have some other things to add to that as well. Well, I think just adding, you know, like abstracting again up to the system level, you know, we've, we've um, the harm that comes from producing a deficit discourse about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people mm. and uh, inherent um, assumption that, and, and the data does show, well, um, if you, you can only end up in prison if you've committed a crime, um, but the precursor to that is policing too. So we do know that, um, that our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people are more targeted by police, even in COVID-19, there's been more, um, some evidence about Aboriginal people being more um, likely to be picked up by the police in relation to you know, um, physical distancing and other issues. So um, we do have to, I suppose, you know, really push ourselves to start to question 
um, what the role of um, police is. And also the other harm that comes is by, is by not believing the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elders when they say that they've got solutions that they would prefer to enact at a local level and by not investing in those because it's incredibly corrosive to not be respected or cherished, dare I say, um, or, um, or empowered and to be oppressed and to use, I don't use that word, you know, lightly, but I do believe that it is um, oppression. It is bias and it's soul destroying. Uh, and to think that a nation uh, as, you know, advanced as Australia in many ways cannot get itself out of this issue and continues to see its over-incarceration of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people grow is profound. Um, and so there are some ugly truths there. You know, that missing data or, you know, there's this, that little, you know, no evidence isn't no evidence. It's often that the research hasn't been done and it's certainly rarely been done from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander perspectives to whenever you do um, read, put it through the spin cycle um, when you're critiquing, you know, who are the authors, what's their vested interest in this and ensuring that we do get good perspectives on, um, on any of the programs and resources that we allocate towards solutions that they are Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people's self-determined solutions. Um, my favourite work's been with the Healing Foundation and the Stolen Generations National Committee who put together a collective healing resource. And I generally do work from a healing paradigm, even though I'm right into systems level, um, systems issues. Um, but um, it's multi-level empowerment and the more on a journey of healing individuals can be, the more likely we can participate in advocacy and you know, policy and system reform. The system has, has to support us in, um, and be open to Aboriginal ways as well. It's both ways. Um, but ultimately, the, um, you know, the healing from trauma and PTSD is um, very important. And um, so, so we've got yeah, very little what we would say evidence but that's very challenging, um, you know, methodologically to ignore knowledge built up over time, over generations, over thousands of years. And what the elders from Stolen Generations um, said in the Healing Foundation, well, actually, they, um, we helped document a program logic in healing where they shared what they believed would create the best outcomes. And so that's based on knowledge as passed to them about how to do business. And it's simply my job to keep um, enacting what they have said to do and, um, and try to get evidence from that perspective. Yeah, so it's really important to critique evidence um, because the, what results is systematic exclusion otherwise and uh, throwing more at it from a Western perspective rather than Aboriginal perspective may well produce a continued worsening that we've seen. Um, so our pop Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander population is really different to mainstream Australia as well. So you have to remember that almost half our population, I think it is, is under 21 which means, you know, when we think about Aboriginal population, it's my teenagers are like the median age. And if we we're going to design services in criminal justice and health, it's really about prevention. Um, whereas, you know, it's very different when we design them for an ageing population. So that's the other real way to give yourself a software update in your thinking is... Um, you know, from that whole of population perspective about who Aboriginal people are. They're young and deadly and Australia's got an awesome future because there's some data that shows they're amazing uptakers of new technologies. Um, and you imagine if we put Aboriginal cultures together with new technologies and what the future's capable of. But if we have that deficit belief, 
and these old romanticized notions of who Aboriginal people are, then we belie our own in intelligence, what Bruce Pascoe says. We are so unimaginative um, about the future. Yeah, so evidence, getting better evidence from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's perspectives. Yeah, it's very important. Thank you very much. Um, so we'll move on to the next question. Um, how has COVID-19 impacted the prisoner population in Australia? And I'll throw it back to Stuart first. Um, <clears throat> part one of the answer is we don't know because of the really concerning lack of transparency of criminal justice agencies. <clears throat> part two is to say that we do know that there have been reductions in the prison population. Um, which is a good thing and that was in response to concerns about overcrowding um, and the potential for rapid spread of infection in those settings. Um, although it may be that they've just deferred the problem because what they've done is given people bail who might have been remanded before. Um, so they might end up in custody anyway. So it may just be a delaying the problem rather than anything else. Um, probably the biggest concern is that uh, COVID has resulted in lots of lockdowns. Um, and this is a good example was a Brisbane Youth Detention Centre recently where there was a staff member who was diagnosed with COVID. And so uh, the whole place was locked down. And again, when we're thinking about young, vulnerable people um, with often with cognitive disabilities, uh, mental health problems who are just lonely and scared, locking them up in cells by themselves for 23 hours a day is not a, a good idea. So I think the biggest impact of COVID on the health of people who are in prisons and youth detention centres in Australia will not be about infection. It will be by a large margin about the mental health impacts. Yeah, look, I agree. And, you know, I, I, I've personally witnessed the great damage from solitary confinement um, and, and the, the real worry that that is I mean, you, you think about the longest you've been alone. I doubt it would be 128 days. You know, so these, these are akin to forms of torture that we could say have been perpetrated during COVID-19 in, in Australia's correctional facilities. You know, maybe not systematically, and maybe there have been other decent responses, but we've certainly heard of um, extreme punitive treatment. And like Stuart said, we have not um, seen the end of it yet. And we could well see a worsening as well, unfortunately. So uh, can, I, can I just add there, uh, our, it amused me earlier, it didn't really amuse me, when the federal government announced additional um, Medicare subsidised mental health sessions in recognition of the impact of the lockdown and, and our COVID response on the mental health of people in the community. Um, meanwhile, people in prison and youth detention are excluded from Medicare entirely. Um, and it seemed to me remarkable that uh, given the government's clear recognition of the mental health impacts of lockdown on the general community, um, that to have such a vulnerable at-risk population uniquely excluded from any subsidies for mental health um, care just seemed disgraceful to me. It's just a typical illustration of the absurdity of the situation. Thank you both very much. Um, so my, this might be our final question um, before we get on to the, uh, yeah, the attendees' questions. Um, are there currently any policies in place to facilitate cultural safety and practices whilst in custody setting? Um, and if not, is there any discussion regarding implementing these changes and kind of what are the limitations um, here? There are little examples. I think there's a lot more we can do. And I think I'll just mostly to defer to Megan here. You might want to talk about I'm Hip Youth among other things, Megan, but I'll defer to you. Yeah, sure. I have been pretty nosy, um, you know, working at the National Centre for Cultural Competence and, um, uh, but also working, you know, in justice health more broadly and, match, you know, being conscious of matching those two up. And um, there are plenty of documents that mention cultural safety or, and cultural awareness, but actually there's no routine training of justice health staff just as there's not of um, university lecturers who train justice health staff. 
um, there's no requirement whatsoever for um, any, any educators. Um, most universities have got an Indigenous graduate attribute that, um, but you know, you question yourselves about when you graduate, how confident, I, I talk about competence, but I think within competence is our confidence, how confident are you going to be that you're going to be able to basically get out of the way and privilege your local elders' visions for what healthcare in that setting um, is needed to be. And um, also Justice Health is um, in New South Wales is, um, you know, well, as Stuart and I've talked a lot over the years about universalism and targeting too, but also the current policy directions to mainstream Indigenous health too. So that um, really it's about Aboriginal people fitting into mainstream programs rather than mainstream programs, um, you know, being for the majority of non-Indigenous people and um, specialist programs being in place for Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people. Cultural safety can only but be assessed by the people receiving the service. So we already know we, we never assess that. And it's really hard to. And if, ja if jails don't have the resources for, you know, the health programs that are required, they certainly don't have the resources to assess cultural safety. So um, we're never really going to know. But the rates of reincarceration are one indicator that whatever's occurring um, according to legislation to rehabilitate and reduce the risk of reoffending is um, pretty obviously not working as well as there being other system issues at, at play and determinants like poverty. Um, yeah, so I myself have grave worries. We do hear about the toxic culture too of, um, of the, um, you know, officers compared to program deliverers as well. And, um, and with privatisation of prisons, there's less um, control that the state government has in training those custodial officers to. Uh, there's, we, we've heard from our commissioner recently about his great concern about the, um, the toxic culture that's there among the workforce. So there's, yes, yeah, certainly a lot of work to do. Um, that's why, you know, you as interested medical practitioners, um, you will have influence by um, being able to hold systems to account. The issue of Medicare that Stuart's talked about is one to really um, come to understand and also it often excludes Aboriginal community controlled health organisations as well. Um, so it's another sort of topical dangle for you to um, get your heads around. Yeah, but also I think the place to start is you, like me, and understanding my own culture and the biases that I might um, have and constantly convey. That's you know, the simplest way to understand cultural competence, which leads to cultural safety. I'd love to recommend the Indigenous Allied Health Association's statements on cultural responsivity. They're the ones that I respond to, I suppose. Yeah, so grave concerns, unfortunately. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to now ask some of the questions that um, the people here tonight have asked um, and going off the ones that have the most votes. So um, the first question is for Megan. Um, you spoke about a healing approach. How can we as medical students um, and other allied health professionals help to allow space for and facilitate healing for First Nations people? No, I'm, um, I am a big supporter of, of group-based um, healing it is a cultural process and all cultural process so much of what aboriginal people have done has been you know in groups and that it's not necessarily one-on-one -on -one. the strong identification that people who've been there done that get from each other is um just can never be understated and also healing is a process too and often people don't um, you know, identify, oh, I need help 
I as one person am going to go access help. It might be in a men's group or a women's group when topics get aired and safety grows to start to identify issues that a person might then seek that formal or therapeutic care. Um, so in that real safe group environment. And so that's obviously really different to the medical model where it's really about treating the individual and identifying, getting that ident individual to identify what problems they might have in order to diagnose them. But often with Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people, like Stuart said, there's so many complex and competing issues that a person actually can't, you know, specify until you're relating with others with similar experiences and you have the aha moment that then um, other people can connect you to get support. So that's called collective healing and um, so that group-based work and I've seen it work magic with individuals. Um, that's just my experience. I don't, there's no evidence for it, but, um, but there's nothing to stop medical practitioners from helping get Aboriginal men's group going in a prison or a, or a young women's group or, or something like that to start to support that collective healing process from which individuals usually start to identify their own needs and their own pathways forward. But um, we haven't, as Aboriginal, you know, specialists in this area, we haven't been believed about the benefits of men's groups and women's groups. Um, we've seen a shrinkage in our time. <coughs> Part of me of those types of things occurring, certainly during COVID-19, um, the punitive approach has been to close any of those things down rather than think about other technologies and other processes that might still be able to support collective healing too. Um, yeah, so, but again, you won't be able to support it unless you've had a bit of an experience of it as well and understand it, you know, a little bit from an insider perspective about what's so valuable about collective healing and the mainstream do have like support you know support groups is probably the closest thing that kind of comes to that so yeah so it's another part of the big learning journey about health and well-being from aboriginal Torres Strait Islander perspective it's that shift from individual to collective um certainly but it's that safety that the collective brings that is just it's just such a relief that's what i say as a health practitioner it's a real relief to see other people support each other through processes so that the reliance is not on the professional because that is so extremely stressful when you're the professional that someone relies on. You want them to have a broad base of support and that's what collective healing can offer. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so our next question is for both of you. Um, do quotas for Indigenous staff exist in the justice system? And if so, are they being met? Megan, I'll leave that one to you. Yeah, no, they don't. Um, I've just done, yeah, had a really close look at um, workforce data. So um, it's been 1.6% uh, target in New South Wales through the Public Service Commission, which includes justice, um, health, as well as corrections. And Public Service Commission have actually just put it up to 2.3%. So obviously Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are 3% of the overall population. New South Wales, I think is 4.5%. So 1.6, damn it, that's selling us short. We're only gonna set a target of one point. It's so disappointing, it's so, Boring. Oh my goodness. But you know what? Most government um, departments can't even meet the 1.6%. And um, I just simply use a metaphor of gardening. Um, prepare the soil. You want something to grow. You want a workforce to grow. You want, you, you know, your seedlings to grow. Make sure the soil's really great. That context that staff work in. Make sure your HR policies actually match your workforce. Um, and that HR has done cultural competence and cultural safety training so that they can look after staff as they progress through um, entry and recruitment and settling into a new job. So Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have a much higher um, 
you know, separation rate from the public service than other than mainstream. And um, there's a great book out at the moment, new book that's won the Stanner Prize through the Aboriginal um, Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies. It's called Unmasking the Racial Contract and it's Aboriginal people's experiences of racism in the Australian public service. The research I've done last year, 50 in-depth interviews, eight focus groups with um, health workforce, Aboriginal health workforce about their experiences um, was eye-watering. Oh my goodness, way more shocking what people have experienced than what I thought. But unfortunately, the report's been suppressed by government and it will only be available in September 2021 if any of you want to apply for the findings through Freedom of Information. So unfortunately, um, yeah, there's a lot of challenges and um, absolutely astounding. So I, I just look to Aboriginal community controlled health organisations where often over 50% of the staff are Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people. The other workforce project I've been involved in, the report was just um, put online by the Lowich Institute in the last couple of weeks called We Are Working For Our People, which highlights um, some of the um, really great contributions Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people make to the workforce and to organisations to, to invest in, to grow that workforce. And um, there will be a report coming out soon. We've just done our first national workforce um, survey of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And the data varies a bit, um, some different items, but, um, but certainly like it, it, exclusion being left off agendas um, and racism in the workforce are pretty frequent experiences. So yeah, absolutely major work to do in mainstream. But if Aboriginal community control are doing so well, I would just simply say, let's look at those models of care, the models of governance and the cultures of those organisations and ask, boy, you know, gee, what are you doing so well? Not that it's all rosy, but um, I, I suppose the stats do show where success lies. And I hope that all of you get the opportunities to work in Aboriginal community controlled um, settings at some point to, to really understand from the inside. Absolute shocker, fail, I'm afraid. They're around workforce targets, yeah. Okay. Um, well, I guess yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the info. It's very sad. I guess that it uh, yeah can't even be met with such low targets. Um, so, uh, sorry, just finding the next question. Okay, so um, probably have time for two more questions. So the next question is um, for Megan. Um, what does effective Indigenous health education look like? How should these multi-level models be incorporated properly um, and how should it be evaluated? So a big question, but <laughs> um, as much as you can. I don't know. Well, my, my um, experience, I think I've coordinated, I think it's 21 subjects, 21 uni subjects over my time. And um, yeah, the, the learning that has um, immersion is because we, a couple of us have researched some of our teaching as well, and that immersion in settings with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have um, been shown using the growth and empowerment measure, actually. And we do have a paper in Australian New Zealand Journal of Public Health about it, using this particular measure, showing that, yeah, students um, overall, yeah, confidence in engaging with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander issues increases when they have been learning from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's settings. So it's probably sounds like it's probably a no brainer really. Um, but that links to, you know, transformational learning theory that says that you, you do need that immersion and the challenge and to have um, your perceptions disrupted, but not only disrupted, but replaced with um, examples of good leadership. So I definitely look to the leaders in Indigenous medical education, the Lyme networks, um, 
documents there they should all be freely available to all of you and hopefully your lecturers have been informed by Lyme Lyme's work and I know University of Melbourne have been very active with Lyme network over the years if you do get the chance to go to a conference um, I'd really recommend that and have a look up um, some of the conference materials from the past too but this you know when I moved from Brisbane to Sydney and um, you know was new here I couldn't make any assumptions about applying knowledge from, you know, what I knew. I just volunteered and got a mentor. So if any of you move around, you just ask. I don't know much and, you know, is there some something I can contribute to or do or volunteer so that you can. You don't, um, I suppose it's the real tension and, and real disappointment that Australian people in Australia come to learn about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island issues because we're a workforce topic rather than because we're the Indigenous peoples of this land that our Australian citizenship ought to have an identity connected with too. So, yeah, that's why I encourage people to use some of their own time rather than um, work being a work issue or a uni issue. I suppose. Um, and the irony is that when you do put in time at the beginning and it feels like it takes time, when you develop strong relationships, everything happens quicker later on when you've got those strong networks of um, trusted people to, to rely on later when, you know, in your practice. That's my experience anyway. Thank you. Um, so our final question is for both of you. <laughs> Um, what are your thoughts and opinions on the recent Raise the Age campaign for the imprisonment of children and the decision made? So, might start with Stuart. Um, very briefly, uh, clearly it's a good idea. The, the evidence is strongly in favour of increasing the minimum age of criminal responsibility um, to at least 14. The Council of Attorneys General recently decided to put a decision off on that until 2021, although ACT has now moved ahead. Um, and although I haven't seen anything official, my understanding of their reasoning is that they want they were not satisfied that there was an alternative. Um, and this, of course, is an absolute condemnation of um, the systems that we have in the community to protect vulnerable kids. Um, because what they were basically saying is, we agree that locking up 10 to 13 year old children is not great, but we don't really know what to do with them instead. Um, so that would be my view. Clearly we should be raising the age, um, but in doing so, we need to make sure that we're investing in support for these young people in the community. They deserve a better lot than they're currently getting. Yeah, wonderfully said. Um, yeah, that family supports to, you know, putting that on, on the agenda. Um, our family support services and funding, I think, has been eroded over the last 20 years. Um, so to really prioritise, yeah, that family-based care. And um, the Raise the Age campaign to really add attention with uh, abolitionists as well. And... I would never be afraid of that word and really getting comfortable with considering the, the reduction in prisoner numbers overall and a closure of prisoners of prisons because there have been examples um, from around the world in, in modern times where that has been possible. So I also have slight worry about raise the age having a, a, a assumption there of the continuing increasing rates of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people's incarceration as well. Yeah, unfortunately. I just often think in my head, if only people could go get taken to hospital or healthcare rather than to police when there is an issue, say on the street or in the home, um, if only a health assessment could occur or there was a safe place like Aboriginal organisation in Brisbane has sobering up centre. You know, if only there was that intermediary, it's, theoretically it's called an intermediary care. If only there was that intermediary care until such time as um, assessment and connection to 
caregivers and supports could be made before there was a policing response to just to slow that process down before police decision making about what's going on because as Stuart said earlier people have multiple health issues and the deaths in custody that we've witnessed this year as in the past are often people with health issues and mental health is no exception um, to that and risk for suicide should be taken as seriously as you know risk for um, death related to any other health issue too so yeah it's yeah i bet you some of those police regret that too <laughs> they, you know miss 10 year days death and not going to hospital instead even though miss naomi williams you know was turned away from hospital several times that young fella up in Torres Strait Island inquest only recently showed he was turned away from hospital multiple times as well so it's all a bit circular isn't it it all comes back to that mainstream workforce willingness to not believe the deficit discourse about us as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and to actually take some pride in our cultures in this country but that's circular too because it takes the opportunity to be in and among aboriginal people to learn and um develop relationships with and, and be among and not be so scared people are terrified of me i'm not that bad Stuart. am i we've had a few barneys over the years but really as i started out i'm into unity and the elders I've been among to the most beautiful, loving, peaceful, spiritual people who yearn for, you know, a wonderful future for all of us together To That's the true spirit of Aboriginal people being connected to the environment. I think that's something we've all got in common. Nature, Stuart, big nature lover. You know, so yeah, that's right. Looking for the similarities, not the differences in our cultures, but it takes understanding what your own culture is and reconciling within oneself about that too. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much um, for coming to speak to us tonight and for answering our questions. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed as much as I did. I, I thought it was really um, enlightening what you both talked about and. Um, Thanks for, you know, sharing those resources and hopefully, um, you know, um, we can, um, yeah, act on what you've said and really think about what you've said. Um, so thank you very, very much.